chapter 3, okay? Um, and we going, right? Yes, we're on. Okay, good. Chapter 1, what, what's this story about so far? About a guy who's looking to find his story and he's going on a path. His dad, he's finding out that his dad had a similar path. Right. And that was chapter two. Chapter one was about uh, a little princess. You didn't, you didn't hear that. Yeah, right. Um, I didn't hear. I know. Because the, the whole, it's, it's really one big metaphor for the different aspects of ourselves, the masculine and feminine. And um, <clears throat> we'll get her story where she goes inside, and his story where he goes, and runs away and does adventurer stuff and she kind of is real quiet and does her little art stuff by herself. Um, and then at points in their story they they're mature now and then they re-encounter the dragonfly which was the first the thing that kind of set them on the journey. And one of the things I want you to think about or feel or whatever is as the story progresses, you know, we had one whole chapter about her and one whole chapter about him. As the story progresses, uh, they begin to get woven into the chapters in sh shorter and shorter intervals. Okay. And part of the thing that's going on with you is you are bumping up against the different aspects of yourself right now. You're going, oh, <laughs> hey, I didn't know that was you. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And the intervals will get closer and closer and closer until you have another one of those two. Like insight, insight mm -hmm. and revelations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, chapter three is called Boundaries and Walls. She awakened early, refreshed, somehow eager to begin the day. She moved quickly into her studio where an unfinished uh, picture rested on an easel. She had been working trying to capture the iridescence of one of the dragonflies who lived within the walls of her castle. She was waiting for the light to be just right so she could reproduce it on the canvas before her. Now over the years she had developed her taste and sense of beauty and sought to manifest her vision through various art forms. But no one had ever seen her work for she kept it secure and hidden behind the walls. Her studio was placed within the upper floors of the place. Adjacent to the studio was a balcony which caught the sun's first rays and gave her a panoramic view of the countryside and the township below. She was sitting, awaiting the light when she saw him silhouetted in the rising sun. He was astride a huge war horse walking slowly into the town square. The town itself was beginning to stir in the sounds of doors and smells from cooking fires and laughter of children and conversations of the market were beginning to rise and fill the air. She watched him as he dismounted and began to interact with the townsfolk. She noticed that he was tall and handsome and had an easy manner about him. As he moved through the growing crowd, she heard the laughter rising through the streets, saw the smiles and the good-natured hand slaps given and received as though he had known these people all his life. But the most unusual aspect of it all was that his laughter echoed through the castle, that as his laughter echoed through the castle, hundreds of dragonflies took flight, stirring the air and filling the space with light. The castle was a flutter, and to some degree so was she. She had seen handsome men before and would on occasion take a lover, but this was a very different thing. Something in her shifted. It was small, almost unnoticeable, like the beginning of a thaw in the spring. Only one drop, but that one drop precedes the later rushing of the waters. Her eyes sought him out, curious about this new sensation and its genesis. Surely he was not the cause of the disturbance in her castle, she mused. But he was closer now, and she watched his gentle swagger as he moved through the town and its people. She moved closer to the edge of the balcony for a better view while unconsciously straightening her gown and hair. Silly, she thought to herself, no one can see me here. And who is he anyway? Just another traveler, warrior, wanderer, loud, full of himself, selfish and shallow, she thought. 
But even as she dismissed him with her thoughts, her eyes continued to study him. The dragonflies had quieted themselves once more, but there was still an energy, a palpable buzz that filled the room. It was as though the creatures were poised, ready to spring into flight once more upon the slightest provocation. And she appraised him, unconsciously seeking a reason to avert her eyes to move on and return to her pursuits. But the more she studied him, the more she wanted to see. She was anxious, curious, and excited at once. She liked the way he filled the shopkeeper's doorway across the street. His hands were above his head, holding his weight as he rested against the facing. She listened as he spoke. His voice was gentle yet commanding, questioning, commenting, and was infused with that infectious laughter. His smile could light up a darkened room. She watched as he moved up the street, interacting with people and moving on as if searching for something or seeking directions. Whatever he was doing brought him ever nearer her castle, and she found herself intrigued by this stranger. He was amazingly handsome with a strong, broad chest and shoulders, she noticed. But it was the energy about him that held her attention. She had never encountered such a person. He seemed somehow familiar, yet totally outside her waking experience. The dragonflies shimmered as he neared. She noticed him looking about as if seeking a lost treasure or some guide for his next steps. She followed his eyes, trying to discover the intent of his actions. He was now within feet of the castle wall, but she, confident in her concealment, was bold as she leaned over the balcony to view him from a better angle. She saw his head turn, and she turned with him. Her eyes locked on a small silver creature flying just ahead of him, and her heart leapt. She knew her friend in an instant. It had been years since she had seen those silver white wings, and it seemed a lifetime ago since it left her with a kiss and flew away. Now her friend was back and moving directly towards her. Unknowing, the eyes of the stranger also followed the arc of the creature's flight. As they both caught the shimmering point of light, it flew as if strategically so that their vision crossed paths. The dragonfly flew into the castle past the princess, but her eyes were locked with his. She found herself transfixed, caught in his gaze. Deep, dark brown eyes like tunnels into his soul. Recognition of finding something she had not known was lost. The royal blood flowed, pumping wild and untamed into her life. Heat more profound than flesh engulfed her. As he gazed into those eyes, a slight as she gazed into those eyes, a slight shifting tilted. A single drop was joined by others and became a melt. She felt open up. The old longings arose and were somehow answered. And deep within her contentment and peace and beauty, deep within her contentment, peace and beauty settled upon her and left her breathless on the sound of her long, deep sigh. The eternal moment was broken as she noticed him blink, tip his hat to her, then quickly turn and walk away. She was startled and jarred, confused. She was not shocked by him walking away or even seeing into his soul. She had long studied people and many had come and gone, but when he tipped his hat, she knew he knew. She realized that he had somehow seen through her concealment. Her boldness morphed into modesty. She tried to still her racing mind and heart. She felt exposed, but not endangered, innocently naked under those eyes. But what had he seen and where did he go? It had happened so suddenly. He had seen through the veil, and that had never happened before. And she didn't know what it meant. He had seen her and was gone before she fully realized that it had happened. All she really knew was that a spark had gone off inside her, and her heart was bursting into thin air. Now he had traveled through the night, making his way along the lake shore. He moved at an easy pace, following the winged light, but now he knew somehow his destination waited for him a few miles ahead. He observed his surroundings. He watched the stars and the moon move across the sky and he studied the vague outlines of the landscape in the dim starlight. He cataloged the sights and smells and night sounds as he moved. It was second nature for him to observe and study things. After all the many years of wondering, it had by now become an unconscious act. His conscious mind was somewhere else. 
And as he moved toward his ultimate goal, his mind journeyed back along the many paths he had wandered. The restlessness, the feeling of being unfinished, and no matter what he accomplished or strength acquired, the weakness and insecurity remained. He was not without confidence, for in most things he had it in abundance. But he remembered the day of his father's gifting. His father had given him, given him the medallion and instructed him to find the missing piece, to fill the void. He had hinted that he would be forever restless until he, until he did, and no matter then no amount of success or defeat would fully satisfy him. Only the filling of the emptiness would suffice. He had lived his life searching, striving, creating, winning, and losing, and moving on. He wondered what that morning, what he wondered what the morning would bring as he became aware of dawn's first light. He sensed a need for ceremony to mark the day, so he turned toward a sandy shore. There he attended his horse and then moved toward the water. He disrobed and began bathing himself. The cold water in the gray dawn covered him with goose flesh. His nakedness revealed the scars from battles and wounds received along his long road. And few had seen his scarrings, none had seen them all fully revealed. He shaved himself and oiled his body and hair. He dressed himself in fine linens and soft deerskin boots. He carefully groomed his war horse and brushed him till the coat began to shine. He checked his appearance in the dawn's reflection on the still water by the shore and prepared himself for the last leg of the journey. As the morning light made its way into the valley, he saw a little township snuggle between the hills and the lake shore. He found a road which ran straight west into the village. He felt the rising sun on his back and his destination was slowly illuminated before him. As he studied the town, he wondered where his guide had gone, but, no direction, with, but given no direction, he followed the road. As he arrived on the outskirts, he saw what, that the townspeople were beginning to stir. He was also aware of the growing anxiety in his gut. Part of it was that he was never fully comfortable in towns. Though he had conquered many, he had never managed to feel at ease in them. He did not trust them, but this particular feeling was deeper and more profound, and it was tingled with excitement. His heart beat a little faster, and, he entered the, and as he entered the town, he repeated, follow, dragon, light fly. And he reached down inside himself and found his friendliest smile. It's closed. Go. Go. Bye. Um, this ain't a cruise where you can just show up for the show when you want to. <laughs> That's the $30,000 rehabs. Okay. Um, where am I? He, found, he reached down inside himself and found his friendliest smile as he approached a farmer sitting up, setting up his wares in the market. His, his smile was infectious and people were naturally drawn to him. He easily entered into conversations about the town and themselves and such. And the effect on the people was that many times they found themselves discussing the deeper things of their heart. And no matter the person or the topics engaged, they always seemed to feel better about themselves. Whether from the shared laughter or the flattering, honest attention paid to them by the stranger, it felt as if they had known him forever. It seemed to brighten them and lift them up. And as he met each one, he always managed to inquire after information regarding his medallion. They were to the person all curious, interested, and helpful, but none offered any clue to the connection between this place and his quest. Frustration and doubt began to stir in his belly, and he quickened his pace and interactions as he moved through the town until he found himself at the end of it. All that was left was a little shop that he had yet to open and an elegant structure that unnerved him. He turned aside from the structure in his growing unease and approached the shop. He stood in the doorway, leaning casually on it as he called for the proprietor. In a short time, they could be seen laughing together, but he soon excused himself and moved on. Then he turned toward the castle. It was all that remained of the town. 
And he sought guidance, direction, and excuse not to go that way. And with each step, dread and hope mingled and rose like a physical force within him. As he spoke to the last remaining people, he heard the buzzing of wings and caught a shimmering out of the corner of his eye. He turned to follow in a direction which led straight toward the castle. What happened next only took only a few seconds, but for him it seemed that time was frozen in an instant. He was now very near the outer parts of the castle and watched the creature as it flew up and over the wall through the balcony and then stillness. He saw her. Their eyes met and locked. He was transfixed by the beauty before him. With racing heart and stolen breath, he felt at once terribly weak and terribly strong. The impulse to simultaneously flee and pursue almost ripped him apart. Longing flooded him. Beauty washed over him in waves and threatened to cast him adrift. Primal terror rose in him. Feelings he had not experienced since childhood returned with a vengeance. Mocking, laughing, alone, humiliated, he remembered it and it shook him to the core. He had always been a loner of sorts and his journey demanded that his ties be loose to those he encountered. But that one look reopened a wound he thought long healed. A soul wound he carried, a void in the deep recesses of his heart. But those eyes, they knew him it seemed, and he seemed to know them somehow. And to have seen her and yet remain apart, separated by castle walls, demonstrated, announced, and uncovered his shame and his abject aloneness. Nothing he had seen or done or accomplished had come close to that one look. It all faded and evaporated like dew in the bright morning sun. He felt unworthy, yet amid the dark turmoil of that moment, a spark, a seed of hope began to take root. With that, he came to himself, blinked away the moment, tipped his hat to break the contact, then turned and walked away. He had to think to figure this out. This was so far from anything he had imagined or anticipated. His world had tilted, and he needed to regain his footing. What did you hear, if anything, or did I put you to sleep? and I was talking to you about it, counselor, yesterday. The process. That he was going around doing all these things, he was searching, and, and, and but what actually led him was something outside himself. You know, um, like the lion and the um, scarecrow and the whatever, tin man. Uh, their efforts sucked but it didn't matter because their efforts um, are an act of faith. That's what makes it work, not what we do. Does that make any sense? Not finding the right answer, not talking to the right person, not writing the right paper, not finding that special secret magic verse in the Bible. Looking for all that stuff or being in, uh, being in that process puts us in a place for the dragonfly to come back. When it's time, in the fullness of time. Because there's no way to manipulate the dragonfly either. It's, it's been my experience that the more, I, the more that I kind of mine in my head, mine around trying to find uh, inside a revelation, it's just, it's futile, but then there'll be either a 
reading or praying or something like that. Stuff that will come or somebody will say something. And the difference is, is whatever progress I think I, might, I, I make with my mind, it never lasts. But the stuff that I get otherwise, that's like, it lasts. You know what I mean? It's like durable. Yes. Another thing I'm noticing about the story, because I'm rereading it all with y'all, I don't, you know, is that the dragonfly always comes from over here as opposed to right here. And does that make any sense to you? The mining and the intellect and the cogitation and it always seems to come from over here. And I know one way that I describe meditation or whatever is when I'm when I'm experiencing myself between my eyes um, is different than if I'm back here somewhere. Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, did you mean for? So I kind of get sidetracked. Did you mean to see to be like when the princess saw the guy? She was like wanting something she couldn't have. She didn't even know what she wanted. I'm right. But like, she had it. You said she had other boyfriends, lovers, and you know it just seemed like she just didn't know what you could have that one. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's a sense in which we're taught to go to school, make good grades, so you can go to the next grade, go to the next grade, go to the next grade, and one day you'll get a piece of paper, and then you can get a job, and you get a job, and they say, well, if you do this, then one day, if you do this, then one day, if you do this, and then you get old like me and you, and we go, well, that was a bunch of bullshit. Because one day never comes. You know? And, um, and many times we find ourselves, we kind of develop a life behind walls. Rarely are we transparent. Many times we don't even know ourselves, so how could someone else know us? You know? And, um, and we get into these patterns, and they can be fine patterns, but generally, if we think back to our life, we have some similar patterns that lead us along a path and then they break down or blow up or they force us into stopping and going, is there ought to be more to life than this? Y'all ever ask that question? Mm. That's a dragonfly kind of moment. There must be more and then these longings or these, this sense that it ought to be different <coughs> arise in us. And that's kind of the, that metaphor, I think. And because, you know, the idea of the story is she's whatever, 25, 35, whatever old she is. She's grown. She's living her life. She's got her castle in the town and, and she's an artist and she paints and she does her thing. And life is good. You know, and, and then this stranger walks into town and something flutters in her. And she just kind of writes him off as just another old dude who gives a crap, whatever. But something, um, it said, like a drop melted. Something, and that's the process, you know. Very rarely have I experienced God putting dynamite in my crap. It's slow, like the melting of a glacier. Yeah. Um. That's what's sometimes frustrating. Um, I think it's good that we hear, <clears throat> get a lot of different viewpoints mm -hmm. from our lecturers, teachers, pastors, because different things work for different people. For me, sometimes it's difficult um, when I'm talking to the authority figure or whatever that is into the events that you know if you do this this happens if you do this this happens quickly and it's done and it's over and that's the way i live my life that's the way i want it to be but for me it's always been a process it's never ever been say these words and you're done you know? yeah i was always mad about paul because jesus never stopped me on the road and blinded me right you know and then you'd hear 
coming up in church, you'd hear testimonies about, I was screwing my kids and my goats and everything and drinking and then Jesus came and I, my whole life's turned around, turned around. I'm like, shit, I guess God don't love me enough to come say what up, you know? You know what I'm saying? But if you think about that, Paul, however old Paul was, say he was 40, it took 40 years to get him to that place. It wasn't magic. Boom! He had to commit murder. He had to think he, his ego was huge. And I think that's that's probably a lot of it to do because he also feared that just wasn't like that God moment that he had. It was also the that demon moment that sure. he had over and over again. So yeah. it was it was. And thought and thought he was helping God out. You know, kill, he's gonna go help God kill all them damn Christians. So when, when he pulls out, he pulls out and puts on his best smile. That's that's his. Like, that's a wall, also, right? Do what now? When, he, when he's walking through the town, and he dresses up, he puts on his best smile and he's talking. Yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's how you do. That's how I do. That's why I wrote it. But that was his. <laughs> that was his thought process of, of the of the process yeah. itself. Okay. He's doing what he knows to do naturally, yes. but you're gonna find out he don't. That's it, his pursuit of the process through his mind. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, how you doing? Because that. I remember a time in my life I had to stand in front of a mirror and practice smiling. Because one of my mentors was saying, boy, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Because I was going to be Dr. Dick and I was going to be profound and know all these things and be the guru and hey, hey, you know, very serious. You know. um, and this man taught me that... Um, I was sending out a lot of negative stuff that I didn't know about. And so, and when I started, I'd get in front of the mirror and I'd go, hey, how you doing? And my cheek muscles would get sore because I never smiled. I didn't even realize that I never smiled. You know? Does this make any sense? Yeah. And, uh, and he taught me and it was great. He taught me to go like walk downtown and just smile at people and see what happens. And it's a whole, it's, People smile back. If they don't, you don't talk to them. <laughs> and it automatically weeds out the negative folks. Like, he said, do this one time. Go to Walmart, and when they say, how you doing, say, I'm happy. And see what happens. And y'all do this. And just to see. Because I was at downtown Clinton years and years ago, and she had her long fingernails with the butterfly tattoos on them and stuff, you know, clicking, clicking. And she was like, how you doing? I said, I'm happy. And she went, I wish I could say that. I said, you can say that. Say it. Right? It's like she was waiting on permission to be happy. You know? And so I got in a, a habit uh, and I let go of the professor. I'm cool in my tweed jackets and stuff, and now I'm just redneck again. Well, that's where I always was. But still, when I, I get up in front of people, or when I'm, hey, I reach down inside of me and come up with my friendliest smile. When I'm talking on a phone to somebody, I always smile before I start talking. Because there's, you know, it, but yes. But that's still part of the act. You know, it's not bad. Don't get it. Hmm? I get it. You know, it's not bad at all. It's it's better than going, fuck you. Know, that's another act that, like, boy was going to push by me a while ago. Did y'all say it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know you, bitch. <laughs> and that, no offense against him, because I don't know him. Okay, yeah, I, so I'm not dogging him. I don't even know who he is. I'll probably never learn his name. If he's here in three weeks, I'll give him $5, you know, like I did the other one. So. Okay, but in, when you're talking, when I'm talking about, he learns to read this way. He demonstrated part of who he is just by that. He assumes a whole lot about the world. You know? Y'all hear me? Okay. How long has he been here? Two weeks. 
Uh, it don't matter. I don't want to get no this going. Like, like you know, because I'm it's not. I'm not intending on doing that. That was just an example. Um, so, so she has, and sometimes we can have our good life disrupted. Because God won't let us be content with okay. Have you ever had your life going good? What thought was good? And you're like, we, can, we won't be content like that. Doing our tricks to get our treats. And, you know, after a while, it don't matter how much money you got in the bank or how much of this or how many women or how many of this. Or it's just it all gets tired. And it makes us dissatisfied. Um, let me see. And sometimes we can get, do y'all remember when she was looking at dude? And she assumed that nobody could see her? Yeah. You know? And that's like our patterns of behavior. We think nobody can see us sometimes. Like, well, go. Okay. I don't care. I kind of want to talk about him. But I don't care what that person might say or think. If you watch their patterns, you know who they are. You can see through the veils. Unless, if you're not living in your own. <laughs> you know, because a lot of what we do and what goes, I doubt any of y'all in here, but... Many times what goes on up here for 90 days is mutual masturbation. We're all playing the same old games we played before we got here. And the little groups form that seem similar. I mean, you were saying people thought you was crazy. That's good. <laughs> okay? Because if they were doing this similar kind of process, they would understand it. And there's no way to communicate it to somebody who's not doing it. Or who's not wanting to understand it. You know? um, and if y'all see me picking at folks sometimes, that's me trying to poke at the castle walls or the mask or the. It's not, I'm trying to be an ass. Trying to open their eyes. Yeah, because it's not that I, I'm trying to catch them, I'm trying to get them to see what I see so they can drop it. But, you know, whatever. You know, I can be an ass, and without an ass, you would die. Exactly. You know, if you don't have an asshole, you won't know how to deal with your shit. You did that to me with one of the things that I had written. Did I? Yeah, you, you, just, you just said, well, why don't you, uh, like, because it was like a, a song. You, you said, uh, why, don't you, why don't you turn around and make it, look at it as if somebody's saying about you. And I did it, and it opened up. Open up my eyes and let me see. Was it offensive when I no, said it? It wasn't offensive. Okay. No, no, not at all. Yeah. I take constructive. I, I take constructive criticism pretty well. Uh, and I'm saying this out of my own experience, baby. When I first, for a long, long time, when I was writing stuff, and it would be beautiful a lot of times, but I would be writing it to get somebody to tell me that it was beautiful. You know. As opposed to me understanding, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. I spent so much, so much of my time, um, and it still happens, but not as often. When I first got here, and realized that a lot of the stuff I was doing, I was doing because I wanted somebody else. I wanted approval. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And so I just yearned to share with somebody. Mm -hmm. So I would get them to say, you know, hey, wow, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's only like. When you're like in solitude for long enough that you get to like, you're like, I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing it for you. And, and you're like this couple viewing each other from the first time. It's strange but familiar when you're by yourself and, and the parts of you start to integrate. It's weird. It's scary. It opens up a lot of stuff. And if, you, if that energy gets expended, if I say you're okay and, and that satisfies that in you, then you'll never say it. 
That's why I'm such a jerk to you sometimes. That's why you tell me I suck. You suck. <laughs> you know? But you understand that's love. I do. You know, it's not me trying to be an ass. Um, get offended by every little thing. <laughs> well, I mean, when somebody tells you you suck, that's kind of... <laughs> Well, baby, I tried two other times and it didn't get, get so I had to escalate it a little bit. <laughs> so I tried to pat you on the head the first time I met you and that didn't work. <laughs> and the other people, not him, he doesn't skip little things. He doesn't do He's a good strength to kill. He's good to kill. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> but I'm thinking as I reread this thing again that it was helpful for me, it might be helpful to you to remember to remember that you didn't create yourself. Okay? You created this fictional self that was Born a poor white child and da, 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 you know whatever. Mama was a lesbian Eskimo with one leg, and she'd walk me down to, she'd wear red red cowboy suits and walk me down the hall at school like this. You know. And they used to do weird things to me with spatulas or whatever, you know, whatever that narrative is. <laughs> whatever. You already know, said that. Like we didn't create ourselves. I guess. Our environment has something to do with it. Well, yeah. I, I just don't yeah. know how. Like, I know sisters are like the same age, one to the same environment, one's a hippie, or one's a, you know, a preacher. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so, well, hippies are just a different you know, religion. What I'm saying is, they go like, one of them's on drugs, and one of them's up here, I'm not using that because that is just, they're just mm -hmm. totally different. And my sister, my wife's that way, got four sisters. Right them together, and mm -hmm. then, uh, I mean, one of them's, you know, and everything you're describing exists as labels or roles within the world system. Right. They found particular roles they seem to fit, but who, it, who is it that's playing the role is who I'm talking about. Drug addict, maybe don't want. A lot of times the drug addicts are. Well, sometimes the drug addicts are more honest in some ways. Or they're at least, they're, they're able to risk the boundaries, but then they get stuck sometimes. It doesn't take much effort to be a drug addict where it does take some effort, but, you know. To be drunk, because that's hard. <laughs> But, so what I'm saying, how, how that happens, people have this, if I said your environment, then people have the same environment, then one of their brothers, one of them school teachers, or whatever. <clears throat> huh? And they create. They take on roles. They didn't create yourself. So. They didn't. So they created the role. That's what I'm saying. How did that, how did that happen? They got the same environment, pretty much the same thing, boom, blah, 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 blah. blah. Well, some people like to go to horror movies, and some people like to go to romance movies, and some people like action movies, and some people like to watch Kill Bill, um, and John Travolta, and what's his face? What's that movie? So they like different stuff. Yeah. What I'm saying is, that role, that thing that's tied up in ego, is not who we are. I'm talking about the part of you that grows hair, that knows how to open your hand. You don't, you can't put that into words. I mean, you, some, you beat your own heart, you monitor your own blood pressure, you, you know. Um, the part of you that can reflect on what you did or what, there's a differentiation in that. 
There's, that's why the Bible talks about be still and know. Jesus said we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. He didn't say we will, we will believe the truth. We'll know it. Belief and knowledge are very different things. It's when you know something, you don't have to argue with folks about it. It's only when you're just believing and trying to hang on to it that you get into fusses. <laughs> you know, if you know the sky's blue and some retard comes up and says it's purple polka dots, you don't go, no it ain't! Because that would make you retarded too. <laughs> that means you go, oh, maybe it ain't, I don't know. And then you'd get on YouTube and watch Bill Nye the Science Guy and... <laughs> You know he's got another show? I don't know. <laughs> he's propaganda. He ain't. I'm pretty sure it's just funny. I mean, and they used him because there's a ge couple generations of people now that are adults that grew up seeing him on Saturday morning cartoons. So they, it's brainwashed stuff. I don't know. Um, let's see what else. Oh. Dreams can do, and the place where dreams come from is another way of thinking. That's where the dragonfly lives. Outside your conscious. Because you know, are you breathing or are you breathe, being breathed? Because you can pay attention to it, but when you don't, you still breathe. <laughs> Try to figure out. Make your, pay attention to making yourself breathe all day and you'll have to kill yourself at the end of it. <laughs> you know? Because you have to kind of let go. I'm sorry, where am I at there? So they both kind of went through their patterns. And when their eyes met, when you saw that it's you watching you, it kind of freaks you out first. Or it can. It, it rocks you, it, it's something solid. It's real, but it doesn't seem real, it seems weird. But if we've been living a, an act all our life, being real would be weird. I mean, a few weeks ago, I hugged a boy, maybe a month ago, I don't know. And he was all, this weird. I said, no, this love is not weird. <laughs> what you've been living is weird, but you, you think that's real, so <laughs> the real feels weird to you. That's, that's one thing for me, like I'm, as I'm beginning to see the, these different parts of me that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out what, what, who is the real me. And, and then I know you said, well, it's the one who's watching all that. And so... I've tried a couple, of, and I, I think it's happened naturally, but I'm, there's been some times that I've been able to step back and just watch all that. But it feels really foreign, and it's... Huh? And who's the one watching you, watching you? Yeah, don't get me on that. It's too much for Because there's no answer to that in words. That's the trick. Because if you know it, you can't say it. Because <laughs> there's no words for that. It's, the scripture talks about it in a place, it talks about the Holy Spirit interprets groanings too deep for words. That's the place I'm talking about. The place that is too deep for words. From whence our uh, sadness and grief and hallelujah arises. The word is just what we put around that. But it's not the thing. Oh. Let me see. And both of them had an experience that despite the weirdness of it, despite the trauma of it, um, there was a sense that something, this is something real about this. All right, you know what I'm talking about? Something solid, or however you said that, lasting or durable. durable. Um, 
And that, that is, even though he was flooded by all this stuff and she felt all this stuff, um, in the next chapter they're going to begin to make preparation. Kind of like the lion and the tin man and the... Because what they think don't happen. <laughs> it never does. You know, because he, he formalized his, well, I'm going to go baptize myself or I'm going to go wash and dress up and put on my good clothes and do my hair and, you know. And, um, and he gets to town and does his thing. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Y'all see me do that. You know? Um, but all the while he's watching, he's looking for an answer that nobody can give him. You know? Because um, it's, and they would have given it to him if they could. They liked him. <laughs> and so he um, goes back to solitude for a while. This was so far from anything he had imagined or anticipated. That's the area where things become durable. Like, what? <laughs> Does that make sense, what I'm saying? You know? Yeah, and it ain't even what you was looking for. <laughs> Because you had no idea what it was you were looking for anyway. I mean, you know what I'm saying? In terms of making sense. Because we think many times making sense is being clever. And making it work out in a nice little... Making sense means we can sense it, we feel it. You know? Um, does anybody understand Stephen Hawking? Yeah, I don't know. I went with a black hole test. I don't think Stephen Hawking understands himself. You know. Or, or, or the theory of relativity, any of y'all understand that? I don't. Um, but there are people that can understand it and write papers about it. But you can't make sense of it because you can't do it. <laughs> it's just theory, it's all cognitive stuff. You know, um, it's like I can, I may be a wonderful theologian and can talk a lot about God, but and still not know God. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. um, so, anybody got anything else? Questions? That was me, you know. Huh? That was me. Was that you? Yeah, okay. Weird. Oh, after class. It was after class, wasn't it? And we were all by ourselves, and it was dark. Okay. And, yeah. Um, but can I tell, can I say what, what happened as I remember it? Yeah, go for it. Okay, because I don't remember what the class was about. But after class, you kind of either went out and came back or you hung around. And you were talking to me about something and talking and talking and talking and then I hugged you. And you went, oh, not in a homo way. Um, and you needed some, I don't know if you said I need him to hug me. I, was it like that? Or did you have a feeling? It's not queer. So no, no, it, was, it, was, it was a feeling. I, mean, uh, I think you had hugged somebody else. And you I, want to get you some. I, I saw what it did. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't ask. No. I didn't know how to ask. Huh? So that was a dragonfly kind of thing. <laughs> Were we talking about blessing or something that night? Yeah. Yeah. Blessing. Yes. Hmm? You're, you're making the, the, you know, it's not, you know, I bless you with the more, you know, it's, yeah, it's not. My like, magic formula. Yeah, it's not one of the yeah. 
groanings too deep for words. Follow them. And they will answer questions that you didn't even know how to ask. Right? Yep. All right, bye. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir? And spell checks like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I can't spell anything.